Hi, I'm Matt Collins. I'd like to welcome you to Bob Weber Auto Mart on Douglas Avenue here in Racine across from Douglas Park. We specialize in one-year-old, low mileage, almost new cars. And if you'd like to stop by and see them or see them on our website, BobWeberAutomart.com, we can save you between five dollars and $10,000 on your next almost new car purchase. I'm Michael Burke and this is Money Talks. Hi, welcome to Money Talks, the Journal Times online business show. I'm business reporter Michael Burke here at the Red Onion Cafe today inside the Johnson Building with Joe, John, and Corey Oakland. Um, you guys have been a very popular downtown restaurant now for, uh, for quite a number of years, so I've, I've been wanting to get you guys on the show, and, and I'm, I'm glad we can do that. Uh, John, obviously you're the, the patriarch of this whole thing. What's what's your background in, in cooking? How did you become an executive chef and, and all of that? Okay. Well, coming out of high school, I didn't have a lot of direction as far as career. Uh, family friend was the guidance counselor at MATC. We basically went through his course catalog and said no, no, maybe, <laughs> yes, and we got we got to the, the uh, cooking program at MATC, which was highly regarded uh -huh. uh, and still is for that matter. And I think one of the reasons I, I looked at that as as a possibility for a career, or at least something to get my parents off my back to uh, make a decision uh, was that my dad uh, worked for American Motors and more often than not was either on strike or retired and he had a cooking background so he was able to step in and get a job the next day. And was he self-taught or what? He was pretty much self-taught just uh -huh. from working on, on the job with uh, you know short order cooking and so on and it, it was just uh, something that said to me that you know it was a solid background anyway he didn't get rich but he kept an income coming in during mm -hmm. that time and so I thought I'd take a crack at it and it really worked out well for me so what level of training do you have then you said MATC um, how long a program is is that or was that MATC is a two-year associate degree program uh, they have good placement services um, at least they did at that time and I assume they still still do uh, fortunately, the, the biggest part of, of my early career was uh, I was hired by a company out of Chicago, uh, which was a food service contractor, and they placed me with Chef Frank Kaepernick, who we think may be related to Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback. But that's pure <laughs> speculation floating around my <laughs> can't yeah. that many. Pure speculation. speculation. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, Frank was in the twilight of his career and just passed on all his old handwritten cookbooks. Which I still have. He was 72 at the time. Literally really 100 year old cookbooks. So yeah, yeah. Wow. wow. Very cool. Wow. So I worked with him for about three years and then he just at 75 he had had enough. So mm -hmm. um, that's that's when I stayed on. But you said you worked for Marriott. When did that come in? You did something. Marriott, like after, you know, they, they always encourage chefs to sort of bounce around and get different backgrounds. And I've never, I've been a bit reluctant to do that. Um, I, I like to settle in and get comfortable in a place. But uh, so I, d I did try a few things and uh, worked as a food production manager for Cole's Food Store at the time, mm -hmm. briefly. Hated it. Um, worked at several small supper clubs. And eventually the opportunity with Marriott came along. And the reason it was so appealing is it was a five day a week job, which I didn't even dream of that. Mm -hmm. They started me out with three weeks vacation. Wow. So I, I stayed with them. Rare in the world of cooking. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> until, until I made the decision to go on my own after my Marriott stint. Then I was back to six and seven days a week and, yeah, and yeah. one week vacation. Right. So that's where we are now. Yeah. Um, you, have, you opened the first Red Onion Cafe at uh, 240 Main Street, I believe it was, just three blocks from here. In about 2001, does that sound about right? Yes, yep, yep. And then you guys came, and then you then you opened a second one here where we're sitting today inside right. the Johnson Building called Harlan Jay's, which was a, a tribute to your dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you guys consolidated shortly after that. 
But you've been doing catering, I think, longer than that period, right? Did you start the catering before Red Onion, or did that start with it? Well, it was shortly before. It was in, within a year before. Uh -huh. I was transitioning away from Marriott. I did a short stint uh, working directly for All Saints as their executive chef uh, with the understanding that I would be leaving there a short time later. Made a lot of great contacts with the doctors there mm -hmm. and the nurses and so on. Which has been so, invaluable in the catering side yeah, of the business. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. And we still, we still have friends and acquaintances who stop in here. Some of the physicians who are retired still come in. Um, let's talk about um, how do you describe the food at the Red Onion? Anybody who wants to take a crack at that, Corey, you want? To? I would say kind of business lunch. Um, we, we really put a premium on speed um, and being able to still offer quality with speed. Uh, we I would bet, and this is anecdotal, but I would bet we're probably about the busiest restaurant in Racine uh, during the lunch hour where it goes from basically nothing at 11 to having probably near 80, 90 to a, well over 100 people on some days served. Yeah, we've got um, approximately 120 seats in your plus overflow. We had every seat that filled today for an hour and a half where wow. the seat was filled. So, so and we, then plenty of people out there, I don't even know how many were out in that space, but so a lot we, of people we, in a we, short period of time. Sorry, we, we put a real premium on being able to serve that volume of people in this short period of time, but still offer quality food. And I think one of the things that we really, really excel at is our soups in particular, that something that he brings that we talk about his experience um, from years and years of working kind of in the old school and the 100-year-old recipes and things like that. Those are things that the experience that he brings to the table with doing the soups that I think is one of the best things that we do here. And mm -hmm. it, it really um, is is allowed us to serve that group of people um, and give quality and uh, do it fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and, really and nice. yet we make virtually every meal to order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And you have a really nice, fresh salad bar, always. What about the sandwiches? Anything that kind of sets you apart or is different than what others are doing? I think, you know, I, I do most of the menu design on the sandwiches and things like that. And what I've always picked up is, you know, when I go and eat some, uh, at other places, I've actually, when I went on my honeymoon to Europe and I came back with a bunch of different ideas. Mm. And there's, I always try to bring sort of new things to the table whenever we're, uh, we're um, redesigning the menu or doing some new things. And... We have our old tried and true things. We have a couple of things that have been on the menu now for six, seven, maybe even eight years. Uh, but for the most part, I try to rotate things out every couple of years and put in something entirely new in. Mm -hmm. um, we try to do a lot of things with you know fresh ingredients and keeping things um, you know quick, but but quality is always the key with anything that we put on our menu, especially with the sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Lots of cheese. <laughs> Lots of cheese. We incorporate yeah. Wisconsin cheeses as often as we can. Uh -huh. And red onions. Yeah. And red <laughs> onions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's that's the big thing. Basically, the menu is a refle reflection. We we always go through and say, are there things that we need to remove, quote unquote, like duds or something? We have no duds on the menu anymore. We really have have kind of uh, narrow, and we have a pretty large menu for volume that we do here, um, and everything pretty much is popular. And it's just yeah, we've gotten to the point where it's a really comfortable, good menu. Mm -hmm. We update it, we change things, um, but uh, but everything seems to go well. So. I've always been curious uh, in a place where the where the soups change daily. At what point during the day do you decide what the next day's soups are going to be? Are you getting those thoughts during the day or not? Or at the close of one day or what? It, it depends. I, I would say most days it's in the morning. It's all right. What do we want to do today? Or at, you know, really at times, the day of. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, Often. and uh, nor and there are times where we do like plan ahead. We're actually moving more towards a menu where we're going to be planning further ahead on on things. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of you know inspiration straight. I know when I when I do soups downstairs, which I do soups. He does them almost every day. I do them once in a while. Mm -hmm. I'll go into the cooler and just kind of see what strikes my fancy and say, all right, part we'll do something with fresh vegetables. We got a lot of vegetables around. Part of that and, and part of our business in particular with the catering side being so large too is you know you have to make use of everything that you have so if you have a catering for 150 people and you have to order beef tenderloin enough that it would cover 200 people you've got extra beef tenderloin oh, yeah. over so maybe it's uh you know beef uh you know some sort of beef based mm, yeah. soup or oh, yeah. you know same thing goes for chicken or something like that so so there's that balance of you know part of the time it's just making sure that when we have extra things that we've ordered that becomes a soup sometimes it's like right now we've this is one of the months where it's, it's generally a little bit slower for catering so uh -huh. then you're able to map out what you want to do and you get creative and have those different things but yeah, yeah and some days it's the morning of yeah, yeah. um what you've been in two different locations downtown now is this one fantastically more successful than the first one because you've got the rest of the johnson building to draw upon or is it or how, how do they no, compare you know i i was 
told by somebody who was a regular customer at the old cafe that we we started sort of a trend of the early lunch in downtown Racine because the old location, which was smaller, we'd fill that every day as well. And, and this person was telling me, you know, we, we had to start adjusting our whole lunch hour so that we could get in there and get a seat. So we were always popular over there as well and, and generally filled the place every day. Um, the benefit that we have here is just size. You know? mm -hmm. it's, there's just more space. So we used to literally run into the problem quite consistently over there where I would be up front and see people walk in, look around and leave and you'd yeah, see them walk, walk right back out. Oh, yeah, over, yeah. Over, take a look over. at the line. Look so around. The, the great the thing line. here is again the, the number of seats that we have yeah. plus just the fact that the Johnson Building very graciously has this lobby outside of the door here also that uh, they are more than welcoming of people sitting out there as well. That is a great And This, this yep. facility is much more catering friendly for us. Oh. You know, we've got the large commercial kitchen downstairs with walk-in coolers and freezers. Our, our parking is just outside the door uh, near the elevator area there so we can easily load and get on the road with the catering. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, Which, and we'll talk a lot about the catering. Okay. Um, did you guys help design this layout? We kind of redesigned it. it. Um, they had, when they, we originally came in, it was much more built as a cafeteria for the building. Okay. And when we came in, it was kind of with the understanding of moving away from it being a cafeteria and being more of a standalone restaurant in and of itself. And we had to reconfigure the way that we did some things. Um, I, my wife and I spent months, uh, you can't see them in the shot here, but we are weeks uh, sewing curtains and new draperies and kind of doing what we could do to redesign <laughs> the place mm. to make it a little softer, a little less like... Uh, cafeteria, oh. um, and and it, it I think we we pulled that off pretty well given the constraints of not being able to do a full reconstruct and things and um, it's I think it's, it's did you move any support. walls or, or the counters or we any did of get we got rid of a or? lot of counter space uh, there used to be uh, kind of like breakfast bar counters and instead we replaced that with the umbrella tables that kind of bring it again more of like a homey comfortable feel mm -hmm. um, and originally when we opened down here uh, you know I I had just or I was in the process of graduating from college at the time and I, I literally with my degrees in graphic design and that's kind of the one area that I applied it in life I right away went into the restaurant business but I literally painted every inch of the walls and ceiling over there picked the colors literally built things that were um, we have oh, still over in the corner here 100 plus year old uh, pipe organ that yeah. we turned into an espresso bar and that was yeah. one of the things that you know I was able to use that creativity so we brought a lot of that over a lot of the color scheme is still here um, the organ which is now just for show uh -huh. um, but uh, but yeah we brought a lot of the, the the feel of what we could from that space into this space so mm -hmm. it's it's clearly and, and we've been extremely fortunate they had the beautiful blown glass and uh, blown glass bulbs in the window I mean things yeah. like that that are just incredible yeah. so it's, it's been an awesome balance of what was here and what we brought to the mm -hmm. table as well now when you guys consolidated into this location um, I would look back at my old story and you had mentioned Sunday brunches and you had mentioned some evening activity mm -hmm. uh, as well as Saturdays so just briefly touching on those how is Saturday business? You don't have the office environment to draw upon on Saturdays. Do you guys still do okay on Saturdays? Yeah, it's. I would say um, compared to our weekday business, I, uh, the majority of our Saturday business is in the morning for breakfast, and we do our breakfast all day that we run. Um, but for lunch here, it, it, lunch by far is busier on weekdays than mm -hmm. it is on Saturdays, and the mornings are by far busier on Saturdays than it is on weekdays. So oh, yeah. it's kind of switching off the balance of what people are really oh, looking yeah. for. And that's been the strange transition from the old location and maybe it was just a different period of time in downtown Racine or, or what it was, but we used to that used to be the busiest time was Saturday there. Oh. So we would be packed on Saturdays all day throughout, and we would count on that as basically our busiest day. Mm -hmm. um, and now that's pretty much reversed here where Saturdays are much more low-key um, as opposed to the weekdays, which are much busier. Now we make those weekends crazy with caterings but, yeah you know, that's, oh, right, that's right. a good balance yeah so it's not bad that's not been a bad transition to be right. a, being a little bit slower on on uh, saturdays because like you said we have caterings and it's that actually opens up our ability to handle bigger caterings and do better um everything basically well since you guys have raised uh catering let's start to talk about that a little bit uh, what what portion of the business and and this is the part i really want to talk about because you know anyone who's eaten here can kind of see the red onion cafe they know what it is but they don't necessarily understand the catering side of it. It's, it's fairly invisible mm -hmm. unless you've been catered by you guys. Right. So what percent of the business roughly is it? Sales-wise, about 40 to 45 percent of the business. Mm -hmm. So that's a big, big catered. chunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. And what sorts of uh, what sorts of events do you tend to cater? What sorts of venues and, and over what area? We, we do lots of weddings. 
Uh, we do high school reunions. We're trying to incorporate the Red Onion itself uh, as a uh, location to have caterings. And we've been pretty successful filling up Fridays with rehearsal dinners, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, Four uh, different class reunions in here this year, which is great. Yeah. Three different schools. So it's, oh, yeah. But yes, I mean, that's, there's a great diversity of things that we're doing. Well, the fun side and outside. The fun thing with this space especially is that you wouldn't know it at, during the daytime, but at night, once the lights are dimmed, it transforms the environment completely in here. Mm -hmm. It actually becomes a really cool um, place to have evening parties and things like that. And that everybody that comes in like, wow, this is... This is totally different. This is, wow, uh -huh. this is really they're, cool. Yeah, they're, like you said before, they're expecting, you know, the soup and sandwiches. Uh -huh. and they're getting filet mignon and, you know, yeah. things like that and, and cocktails and all that. So We've it's, it's, literally had people say, oh, this is just like being back in New York. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. At yeah. night with all the candles and the But as, and as, as far as the, the catering business as a whole, um, you know, for, for lunch, as Joe talked about before, it's sort of fast, high quality, um, things like that. But for the catering size, we really, we really do try to... Um, with with a recognition of you know budget and things like that, we try to serve sort of a or a higher end type meal. We mm -hmm. like to have really great quality. Um, we're not talking about pricing that is off the charts at mm -hmm. all because we have to be very conscious of that, especially you know the last few years. Yeah. Um, but in terms of service, um, quality of food, things like that, I, I like to really stress value. I mean, there there certainly are cheaper options around places, and there are far more expensive options, especially when we cater in Milwaukee. There's yeah. you know we're we're at the low end in pricing, but um, as far as service, um, food quality. You know, we, we really strive to be excellent with those. So things. how often are you doing catering events? I'm sure it's somewhat seasonal, right? When are the busy yeah. times of the year, and what, what's the typical number per week in, at the busy times and, and in the not-so-busy? The so only busy? truly slow times are February no. and March. <laughs> April starts rolling with, with the weddings uh -huh. and on all the various things that go along with spring and early summer. So what's slow for you? Slow would be one event for a weekend. Okay. Yeah. Generally speaking, you know, like right now, February and March are, are to be, you know, there's slower months. We probably have six to seven events booked for each month, including a couple larger ones. Mm -hmm. um, but then in April, like you said, I, I think in, through the end of the year, we'll be lucky if we get a weekend. Well, I shouldn't say lucky. We want the business, but, uh, you know, it's we will be booked probably every weekend for yeah. the rest of the year. And so how many in, a, in the busy times, how many are you doing in a week's time? Three, if, four, five. Yeah, we. I think our busiest week this year, I think, it was five five parties. Um, well, our party on each night of the, of the week, and then we had multiples on weekends. So it was wow. like seven, eight parties, and that was, you know, that's where I really I'd like to stress how good our staff is too here. That, you know, our ca our cafe staff is absolutely outstanding. That they have allowed us to take on more of the catering side. And our catering staff side is absolutely outstanding as well. We've got uh, my mother-in-law who works with us is probably one of the most experienced banquet managers in mm. the Milwaukee area, and she had been doing that at different hotels throughout the area for years. Mm. And we bring her on to, to help us out, and she's becomes kind of a banquet manager for us. So we're able to really lean on having a great staff to allow us to take on a lot of those larger caterings. Um, how far out do you guys go with your catering? Where, what, what's your typical zone, your geographic area that you serve? Uh, generally, and that's that's changed over the years. Where we used to be a lot more Milwaukee, we're seeing almost 50/50 for things. We've we've really been able through great relationships with local event spaces and also the things we do internally. I would say probably 75% of the things we do are in Racine now. Yeah, if, yeah. yeah. maybe yeah. more. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and certainly extending to, to areas and parts of Western Racine. Some events in Kenosha, certainly, but um, you know, there's the handful of uh, you know those areas outside of Milwaukee and Racine, but mainly the Racine area. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's been great. So to stay in the Racine area is logistically an important thing for us because of the number of trips we have to make. Everything is calculated on labor hours and things like oh, that. Yeah. And when yeah. we're spending that much road time and paying a full staff to travel to a like location, um, it's, it's yeah. hard to justify that. Now, what um, when we hit the recession, the corporations just stopped spending money on anything mm -hmm. they did not have to spend money on. So what did you guys see on the catering side? Did you do much corporate business before that? What happened and, it, and yeah. what's happened since then? I, I know. Um, the one that I noticed more than anything was Christmas parties, and we used to do every from Thanksgiving through Christmas Day. We would literally not have a day off, oh, wow. and it would be Christmas parties for you know, private Christmas parties, but a lot of um, Christmas parties, like you said, for corporate. Mm -hmm. um, 
groups, and it was it, that dropped down to maybe a quarter of what it was after oh. that. Really, yeah. really cut back. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be coming back all that much. No, either. no, uh -huh. definitely not. That's one of those things that dropped down and has stayed down. And um, yeah. you know, we've did a few th this year, but it's been not nearly what it used to be in the past. I think maybe the business has sort of embraced not having that obligatory Christmas party too, yeah. Yeah. and just found it easier not to resume them. Or if they do it, they do something in house. I know, um, oh, for yeah. example, I have, I have family that they used to hire out uh, caterers in the Milwaukee area, and they just went to doing a big potluck where somebody, everybody at their, and it's a it's a large manufacturing business. Everybody brings something, and they all mm -hmm. bring it together and share. So I think that's where a lot of the shifting has gone to. Yeah, um, tell me a little bit about the logistics of doing a catering event. Of, let's start with transportation. How do you how do you get the food and everything else you need to mm -hmm. the event? Well, it all. It, I think. It, um, from the planning side, it, it starts. We start planning. Uh, I would say for a large wedding, let's say of like 150 to 180 people, we start planning pretty much from like the Wednesday before to start staging things to either get orders in or to uh, start for things that are further out, potentially even starting to do some basic food prep type things. Like mm. for example, if we're doing a lot of beef tenderloins, we can uh, trim out the beef tenderloins, get them marinating ahead if we want to do things like that. Um, but logistically, when it comes to the day of the event itself, that all comes down to planning and saying, okay, we need to get uh, this hot by this time in order to get, to get it served by this time and mm -hmm. figuring out, okay, which hot boxes are we going to use? How many are we going to use? When is that trip going to happen in the day? If we're taking plates to something, if it's an outdoor wedding, it means we have to take literally a kitchen with us where we go. And it's uh, staging out early enough in the day to get the things that aren't perishable, that can sit if it's hot outside, um, get those things there earlier in the day in terms of, uh, you know, plate flatware and plate and so on. So that later in the day, the last trip is all the food. Where the food gets there, it goes out pretty much. And do you cook any of the food beforehand and just deliver it warm, or most of it? or Yeah, what? most of it. And I would say, um, unless it's something where it's specifically people want a cookout type format, if it's an outdoor thing, or if it's somebody that wants a, a small kind of higher end plated dinner at a home, um, then we're doing the majority of the prep at our kitchen site here, bringing the food there and, and finishing it off. And this is a big part of that is, you know, it's a commercial kitchen, we are very aware of you know food safety things like that you, you don't necessarily want to be going in somewhere else where it's not maybe as clean or as you know the, mm -hmm. the amenities so yeah really i mean catering is about having the ability to make things here and then deliver that exact same quality to a plate maybe 45 minutes later and holding the temperature using the equipment that we have the hot boxes things like that um they're really it's it's uh to take a step back sort of the process can be begin a year out where i'm working with clients on all the details i get everything lined up throughout the year we get everything done and then these guys really do a great job of the execution um, we've been really fortunate we have two guys russ and al gustin who are twin brothers who um, come in and, and are just workhorses and so it it's sort of all this planning goes into sort of that organized chaos and then making sure that the food comes out of the oven is served on a plate 45 minutes later and it seems like it was just taken out of a pan. That's through experience that you learn how to do that. And it really is just a lot of quick hauling and things. Yeah, I'd say catering is more logistics than it is cooking. The cooking's there because we're good at what we do in terms of producing good quality food, but it's mostly logistics and hmm. just logistic planning of, yeah. of times and staff and everything. It's all logistics. Have you ever, despite all the planning, do you ever have something just go a little wrong or cause problems? Well, the weather. Endlessly. Yeah, the weather. <laughs> the weather. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and, and that's, that's the most the, uncontrollable. That's the, yeah, the, the variables are in unbelievable with things and you know we uh, not working. You, you think or about this equipment we're not working oh. where you get to some place where you think you're gonna have a, an oven or a refrigerator and all of a sudden you have no oven no refrigerator and it's okay now do we, okay. Now do we do it and, and it's, of, that's yeah, the business it's a couple of quick anecdotes you know we did a big uh, wedding or it was a, an event for 300 people last year extremely high end we have basically created a portable kitchen with heating sources all that and the fuses are blowing constantly. <laughs> so nonstop. we've got to make a meal that is off the charts awesome in a kitchen that isn't really a kitchen, that we've made a ki kitchen, and the fuses are blowing yeah. every so two to three minutes. we're putting of sterno in these hot boxes for and, heat source. Uh, yeah, I was about to ask you, so how do you compensate for something like that? You, you have, be a have magician. fires, one fire starts here, you put it out, and another one starts, and you put that one out. But we have enough experience, enough great people work with us that response from that was still fantastic. There are some things that you said, outdoor things that you can't control. We did a, an event at the zoo this past year, and it was that stretch where it was literally 100 mm -hmm. degrees, yeah. and even at the lake. Yeah. So it's fine for the hot food, but what about 
dessert things like that. We had these really nice desserts that we made that within 10 minutes, and yeah. the, the host was awesome. Everybody's kind of laughing. The people who were there, they just melt. They literally melt the chocolate, yeah. and everybody, people are scraping them up and things. <laughs> and, and we were keeping them on ice. We were keeping them in the refrigerated trucks. We were doing, but oh, the man. second you bring things out, they'd melt right away because <laughs> it was that hot. Um, we did a, a wedding in Maguanago, um, and uh, it's a beautiful tent. Everything is perfect, so you think it's under a tent. Even if it rains, it's going to be, you know, everything will be great. Mm -hmm. but the only problem was it. They giant, didn't have a tent uh, for us to work in. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> you, we demand that now. <laughs> yeah. We're outside. Yeah, we we've learned that tent. lesson. We stood, we, but, uh, we stood in the rain. I, oh, my God. This, uh, the people I, laid planks and two by fours and sheets of plywood, four by eight sheets of plywood because there literally were rivers uh, running yeah, through the yeah. yard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, not just through the yard, but the, the, the river went through. The bride's muddy this far from the hem up. The, the buffet, it was going underneath the buffet table. There was a <laughs> raging river going through that they brought in planks and built over it. That's hilarious. And, and then there are some other things that we very happily work within the client's taste for things and knowing that it's gonna be a little difficult. We worked a very nice outdoor wedding this past year where the lighting was exclusively candle lighting for an outdoor, no lights anywhere mm -hmm. basically, but candle lighting. And we brought in one little light for us to work with, but you just know that you're gonna be in the dark and you don't wanna affect you know what their view is of the event. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So you, you were very cautious about that, that we are to be basically a, a, a hidden part. The food was gonna be great and you want that to be awesome, but you want the side part to be sort of hidden, but you know, so that's that's the nature of it. And it's, so it's you guys are trying it, to see what you're doing in the dark now. Yeah, and that's it. it's what makes the job interesting and fun. And you know, we really are, we really have become pretty good at this. Where we all um, have worked together so well, and it doesn't mean that there aren't moments of craziness. There always are because mm -hmm. it's it's a big that's job business, usually. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we've become really good at taking organizing that chaos and producing things that are great. Um, Part of it is getting ahead of it, and Corey's very good at that as far as when he meets with the people and he thinks they're making an unwise, unwise decision for the type of menu in the facility Such that is being served in. Like what? serving chocolates have melted a hundred degree weather. Like, okay. <laughs> well, how often does that happen at the I know, yeah. you know, it's all, it usually but, cold. But. No, seriously, if it's, if it's something that would require... Um, well, I, I'll give an example. Like, for example, we do, a, I would say half of what we do, well, not half, 30% of what we do is all customized off-menu stuff where people are like, we would like this, oh, yeah. um, oh. can you do it? And a lot of times there will be things that if you're making for 12 people, certainly you can do that. But once you ratchet that up to 80, 100, 150, 200 people, there are certain things that the variables change a bit when you're dealing with food. So that, for example, if you're doing something that has to be deep fried in small batches, you can't do things that are deep fried in small batches for 150 people at an outdoor wedding in the country. It okay. just is a physical impossibility yeah. to do it well. Mm -hmm. So that's where you steer people away from it. Yeah, yeah there's, so there's some common sense stuff involved with things. And then a, a lot of it, too, is just me kind of helping. And I always say my goal is to execute their vision. So they, they tell me what they want to do, and I give some guidance along the way. You know, it, the average person they have in their head, like you said, maybe we want to do fried fish for 150. Well, that's not going to hold up very well. You can think mm. of, or French fries or something. You know, if you fry something and then you're trying to serve it out on a buffet line or something, even though it's great in theory, it's probably going to get kind of soft. So you say, well, how about if we do a really nice baked fish or something like that? So it's little things like that, but also certainly. I'm just helping people with timing of events, things, because generally speaking, it's going to be the first wedding, or sometimes oh, right. I work with yeah. people on um, large fundraisers where we do year after year, we work on things, so then the challenge is how do we make this different, mm. retain the things that are good, but a different feel for the guests, you know, the 250 people who have been there the last five years, how do we keep things fresh and new? So there's that's where a lot of my guidance comes in. What, what's your current price range on uh, catered events per head? Mm. I'm actually working on uh, redoing the, the catering menu right now. I would say um, average base price um, before you add in like fees, tax gratuity, and sorts of, those sorts of things. I would say the average is right around eighteen ninety five to twenty dollars per person, mm -hmm. somewhere around doesn't that sound range. Too bad because it's, you guys have a, a great reputation, and that doesn't sound bad at all. And and really, you know. I'll, that can vary so much. Whenever people call and ask, uh, we get this question a lot, how much does it cost to cater for 100 people? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different answers to that question. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you want to add, what you want to order, what the, level of, yeah, yeah. the level of service that you're uh -huh. looking for, and all those things. There's a lot of variables that go into it, but I would say that's in the ballpark, plus adding on tax and gratuity and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, John, how often do you add new dishes, and what's something you're working on or, or planning to bring in now that you hadn't for a while? Well, we've We've looked to expand the, the beef portion on our menu. 
with two different fillets on your catering on menu. Our catering menu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we're bringing in the traditional uh, classic dish steak Diane. And then there's another one that's a little bit more of a personalized option, which is fillet of beef Madeira, which is using medallions of tenderloin. Uh, they're floured, they're still pan fried. Um, the steak Diane could be broiled, but pan frying is really the classic way it should be prepared. So you're practicing these things now, or you just know them and you don't need to practice well, them? Well, kind of know them. <laughs> some, sometimes you need a little brush up on it, yeah. and sometimes you can make them better than what we used to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we like to experiment a little bit. Um, we like to try new products. Where our, our suppliers are very good at making us aware of new items that are coming oh, out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we may try to utilize that. It still has to fit into our price structure, however. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we probably should wrap up, but I'm curious about one thing, and that is you guys have a six-day-a-week a week business, and obviously you're all involved. Um, what do each of you guys do on, your, on Sundays, on your day off? <laughs> I've got a couple of uh, side ventures that I'm doing. I have uh, business-wise. Um, yeah, I uh, really. Um, I, I had a group that uh, we came in runners-up in the Marquette business, University Business Plan Competition last year, and that's a mobile development company. Hmm. So I'm doing that. I'm a partner in that, and I also doing some nonprofit stuff. Um, and then on top of that, just the family stuff. Downtime is where I sit down and I watch soccer games on Sunday mornings and mm -hmm. relax. And two twin daughters. Joe's, yeah. I was gonna say Joe's got four-year-old twins, and that's. Oh yeah. Plenty of activity going mm -hmm. on there. That sounds like yeah. fun. Yeah. And How you about know, you? Corey's got the two yeah. youngsters. And, and for me, uh, you know, I my days I don't really have an off day. I try to have Sunday will be a day that I like to try to be with family as much as I can because I have two small children also and my wife Laura. Um, Monday is a day that I'm home, so I generally work five days a week oh, here. Okay. But my Monday is a day that I do everything. I'm a soccer coach also, a high school soccer coach at the Prairie School. So mm -hmm. I, I do everything. I cram all of that into from when I get up in the morning until I go to bed at night. I'm working on soccer stuff, basically. So, And then, you know, when the season starts, I have even less time. So. Of course, yeah. What about you, John? Uh, well, for me, the typical Sunday morning routine is I'd, I'd still get a paper delivery at the house. So I'll, I'll look that over. The Journal Times, I hope. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and the Journal Sun, no. <laughs> okay, that's all right. As long as you get but, us. Uh, I do, too. My Journal Times is in the driveway when I left this yeah, morning. Yeah, great. Other than that, uh, my, my father-in-law is not in the greatest health, so we make sure we get him to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Even though I'm, I'm Lutheran, dragging him to a Catholic Mass. And, but it works out. He's, do you, do you cook for man. yourself on a Sunday? I just Yeah, I like to cook for myself. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, uh, I like especially doing pork dishes and, and grilling outside, things like that. And mm. okay. that's, that's really a nice, relaxing time for me. Yeah, okay. I, I do the same well. thing in the summer. I, I just cook on my fire pit. That's, that's the kind of thing that I like to do is do something completely different than we do here. I still like to cook, but I like to do something completely different than we would do uh -huh. here. So. Do, you, do you cook for yourself? I, I, as occasionally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I still, we can you know, get by. I, yeah, I, I say you grow up in a family like ours. I'm, I'm capable of throwing things. I, I, I think, thought yeah. I made something pretty good last night. I made some salmon and a great okay. sauce that I made for it. It's always winging it, just based on kind of uh -huh. what I know. That's why I say I don't, I don't do any of the food. I meet with clients. I, I yeah. go over details, things like that. Okay. But I think I can hold my own, probably. Good. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's been a really interesting uh, visit with uh, uh, the Oakland family, Joe, John, and Corey at the Red Onion Cafe. You've been watching Money Talks, the Journal Times online business show. I'm business reporter Michael Burke. Thanks a lot to our producer today, Greg Shaver. And uh, please join us again. Hi, I'm Matt Collins. I'd like to welcome you to Bob Weber Auto Mart on Douglas Avenue here in Racine, across from Douglas Park. We specialize in one-year-old, low-mileage, almost new cars. And if you'd like to stop by and see them or see them on our website, bobweberautomart.com, we can save you between five and $10,000 on your next almost new car purchase.